thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and I thank very much the Interfaith uh, Center for inviting me to be a part of this conversation and for inviting me to be a part of your work. And it was an honor uh, to do so a year or so ago with COVID, you lose track of, uh, of time but it was an honor, and so I, it's just a privilege to finally be here, as you say, in 3D, uh, uh, to be with you. And Justin, and I can't thank enough and, and want to continually do that uh, in, in, in a public way, the Grahmeyer, uh, and uh, the work and the recognition of uh, the work that we just try to do, and I am so humbled, and it is still not sunk in, uh, that I am here to receive uh, the Grahmeyer Award, and I cannot uh, say thanks without thanking, of course, Dr. Tyler uh, Mayfield, and how wonderful uh, to not simply receive the award, but in receiving the award, have the opportunity to spend time uh, with Tyler and uh, thank you uh, and uh, for all that you have done to make this possible and thank you for your person and I, so it's a privilege. Uh, I'll finally say and last but not least uh, I was so honored to be invited to this space and of course uh, excited about it and then even more excited when I heard that I would get to see and be in conversation with my colleague and longtime colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Alton Pollard, uh, whose work and uh, ministry I don't need to tell you about, but has been a blessing to us all. And I want to say this in this context, and uh, he knows this, but probably wouldn't say it uh, for himself, that in so many respects, the work that I have been able to do just simply would not be possible unless persons like himself opened the door and the pathways for that to happen. Because Dr. Pollard, way before anyone else was doing it, and when it wasn't a popular thing to do, uh, especially in the circles of which we try to do our ministry, opened pathways for women, for black women, in the church and in theology, and you know, uh, would invite me down into conversations and always used and supported uh, our work and made it integral to the work that he was doing. And so uh, the late uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Katie Cannon, who's a mm -hmm. ethicist, would, who, right, we both mm -hmm. share such uh, great uh, memories and ha relation, had a relationship with, but she used to quote Zornel Hurston all the time, by say, talking about how Zornel Hurston threw up uh, a highway in mm -hmm. the middle of the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I am not exaggerating when I say that uh, Dr. Pollard threw up a highway in the middle of the wilderness for many of us to walk on. So thank you for that, and thank you for making this conversation possible. And yes. <laughs> and so I'll spend, Few, just a few minutes and then open up for conversation uh, to talk about, as the students even asked me uh, this morning, and, and many ask, why Resurrection Hope? Mm. You know, like, mm. how, how, how did you get there? Why did you write that book? Especially in the middle of a pandemic, mm. right? And it wasn't because I didn't have other things to do in the middle of the pandemic, like nothing. But, <laughs> but you know, as a theologian, I really do believe, and even before I even knew what the word theology was, as a person of faith, 
that we are always seeking to understand our faith. And not in the sense of trying to understand doctrines and dogma. I don't think that's what faith is all about. But really trying to understand why and how we can continue to believe in a God that is love, in a God that is just, when all around you are pervasive realities of hate and injustice. And so the fact that a 10th century theologian that was also Archbishop of Canterbury for a minute, Anselm said that theology is faith seeking understanding. When I first learned that in my first theology class, I was like, uh. <laughs> but then, as I became more and more intentional about what it meant for me to be a person of faith, that understanding of theology being faith seeking understanding became more and more real. And so this book, Resurrection Hope, is a testament to that. Mm. There has not been any book that I have written that has started in my head. It started on a, in a journey. And a journey of trying to really make sense of my faith, if not hold on to it, given the realities of what it means to navigate life while black and female in this country. Resurrection Hope was a book I thought I would never write, not because of the nature of it, but because I thought, eh, I'm done with books. Mm. Mm. I have nothing more to say. I didn't think I had anything to say anyway. So it's always amazing to me, and it is, and, and I say that in this in all earnestness, when anyone reads my books. Because typically my books are my way of trying to work out whatever it is I'm struggling with in terms of my faith journey. This book, it was even more so the case my own existential despair and doubt mm. called me to this book, mm. and this book is about that journey. Mm. Because as we were in the middle, have been for a while, but in the middle of the mega realities which intensified the realities of anti-black violence. And then you couple that with COVID that disproportionately impacted the black community. And for me, it was as if two pandemics, one that has long been ignored, came together course, the health pandemic that was COVID and the pandemic that is anti-black white supremacy. And they came together and they fell, of course, upon the bodies of black people. So that if black death had not already become a part of the daily rhythm of life in this country, ah, it had certainly become that that we became a nation, that it was okay to let black folks die. Mm. And COVID laid that bare. And then, of course, mm. you know, the anti-black white supremacy didn't take a holiday even during the pandemic. I found myself utterly on the edge of deep despair. Mm. 
And I didn't know what to do with it. And, and in respects, I thought, this would never happen to me. Mm. And I didn't know how to turn. And I was at the point where I didn't watch the news anymore because I couldn't hear, couldn't take another thing in. And I, as I said, listen, I'm a movie buff. And of course, during COVID, you could catch up. But I found myself not being able to watch another movie that even had black characters in it mm. because I knew they was going to end up dead or something. Mm. Mm. That's what happens to movies, you know. The, first character to die is usually black. I couldn't do it. I literally found myself watching Dennis the Menace, you know. <laughs> no, I was, I was watching the reruns of Dennis the Menace. No chance of seeing black people in that. Oh, that's <laughs> true. But, um, and I remember, you know, as I said, a, 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 a Episcopalians, we don't, we don't talk a lot about religious experiences. The only religious experience you better have is going up to the altar and getting your little uh, communion and sitting back down and being quiet. Mm. But it was like a religious mm. experience because turning over and over, echoing in my ears, and I didn't even know it, I knew it was W.E.B. Du Bois' words, but I didn't know where it came from, was, and it came from Litany of Atlanta, his, his prayer in that, keep not thou, O silent, O God, right? And that, keep not thou, mm. O silent. And mm. I was searching, 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 searching. And then, you know, I heard the words, literally, in my head, in my prayers, of Jesus saying to his disciples, meet me in Galilee. I'm Episcopalian, you know, I don't even know scripture that well. Uh, uh, you know, it's a deadly combination to be Episcopalian and a theologian. Mm. For, forget about knowing scripture. But it echoed in my head and it took me down to Black Lives Matter Plaza which was quite a feat for a germaphobe in the middle of a pandemic. And my hope came alive there. And so this book mm. gives almost an indulgence mm. uh, because it's an, an indulgence of sharing with you a journey. Mm. And it is a journey from faith out of faith to find it again. A faith, a book from despair to hope. And, and, and of course, as anyone that's read it knows I frame it in uh, dialogues that I have with my son, who's a millennial, so they always take place on text. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> all right. And then when it gets so long, we do, you know, then we talk and it's, it's Always, we still have these dialogues, and uh, and sometimes they get so long. I'm like, Desmond's like, oh, it's been two. I said, Desmond, I gotta work. It's like two hours. Gotta go. Uh, to, uh, but that brought me to further despair because it wasn't so much that I was trying to find an answer to myself for myself, but for my son, and that m compelled me to write. And there was two things that he said to me that just pierced. Um, one was, you know, he said, I get it that, you know, God is black, Christ is black, as I've written about it. He said, but it sure isn't helping us now. Mm. Mm. It's a question of faith seeking understanding. Mm. And then he asked, do you really ever think black lives are gonna matter in this country. How can you let your child stay in this place of thinking that their life will never matter? That, that was it. That was, that was, I had no answer. And so I share with you in this book, The Journey, mm. and which was a journey uh, uh, 
and, and so yes, a journey to resurrection hope. To find hope is resurrecting, uh, even as hope itself is that which even out of the midst of crucifying realities, you can get the hope that resurrects and brings new life. Mm. And so that's resurrection hope. Mm. <laughs> when I first came to Louisville Seminary, I shared the story which I've shared often since about how my parents left Mississippi in the fall of 1955. And it was in the weeks after Emmett Till was Emmett. murdered. And how that has been such a defining moment for me as one who would grow up not in the Delta of Mississippi, but would grow up in the uh, blizzard conditions of Minnesota. Mm. And From one Mississippi to the other. Yes, <laughs> because the blizzard conditions had nothing to do with snow. That's right. Um, but it had everything to do with the whiteness of um, the reality. But things have happened even since then. Jessica, who knew you, my beloved, for those of you who don't know Jessica, um, grew up Episcopalian. And you used to be uh, there at the church in Jacksonville. Yep, that's right. Um, decades and decades ago. Uh, and she remembers mm -hmm. um, your time there. And 40 minutes away from where she grew up in St. Mary's, Georgia, there is a young man named Ahmaud Arbery mm -hmm. who is assassinated. I grew up in Minnesota, the Twin Cities. And of course, on the cover of your book, right. among the montage, there is George Floyd. And then we live in Louisville, and here on the montage is Breonna Taylor. Anti-blackness is so pervasive in our society and in our world. Is there any place in the church, let alone society, where one can go to find concrete instances of that resurrection hope? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good question. It's so good to see you, Jessica. Good question. Uh, so many levels. First, yes, let me say this quickly and then get to that. One of the things that I've done in Resurrection Hope was to try to understand this reality of anti-blackness because it's different from simply talking about white racism or white supremacy. Mm -hmm. There is something about the black body yes. that compels mm -hmm. such violent response, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that was, the, the first step of trying to understand what's going on here. Will black lives ever matter? And, and to, in order to even begin to fathom that, you gotta understand this anti-blackness and to name it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can talk about white supremacy and that uh, whiteness suggested white people are superior to everybody else. That doesn't mean you gotta go out and are compelled to kill black people, right? Mm -hmm. And so what is it, what is it mm -hmm. that compels this instinctive response to black people? to our children, uh, to, so that's the first thing. And, you know, so to your question, are there places in the church? First thing that we have to recognize is, first of all, to call ourselves church is aspirational, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Need to live into that. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, then we have to recognize that uh, there are places in the church that certainly foster and nurture anti-blackness. Mm -hmm in the very, not only the theological infrastructure of our church, but in the fabric of many of our churches. Mm -hmm. When we talk about anti-blackness and the theological and biblical uh, <laughs> infrastructure of our church and uh, they come together in the same, you know, we have to uh, think about the ways in which just this sort of light, dark 
paradigms that are, are uh, in the biblical witness. They, it's a short step, small leap from there into anti-blackness, the way we've sort of uh, demonized that which is dark and we can say, that, oh, that's just theological. Well, but it has implications. Yes. And we have seen the implications. And those implications have played themselves out across history so that that which is dark is bad, that which is black is bad, is evil, is demonic. Uh, to Howard Thurman, you, who you uh, has, 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 has spoken about that. So it's deeply embedded within the theological biblical infrastructure of our faith tradition, right? Uh, the great uh, early desert fathers, I mean, they really uh, uh, steeped in that. When we look in our churches, you ask, so how does anti-blackness uh, uh, show up in our churches? We, and we can just talk about the ways in which it shows up in our iconography. That if indeed we really mean that black lives matter and that they matter to God and that they can be a, a way in which to see God, a pathway through seeing God, then we have to have religious iconography that shows black lives as sacred. Mm. So that the only picture of someone black in our church can't be Judas, mm. right? Mm. Uh, uh, and so because that is suggest, well, I don't need to tell you what that suggests, especially when all the other uh, saints and all these other pictures and all this other iconography uh, have been white knives, including Jesus. Why don't we just try to, we, no one knows what he looked like, but we know where he came from. So why don't we, you know, to have these white Jesus is not only theologically incorrect, it is historically inaccurate. Uh, to, so why don't we just paint him as the Palestinian Jew that he was, and then, you know, that might help a little bit. Uh, so where in our churches can we see uh, uh, something that suggests something other than anti-blackness. Well, I think in those churches, just on the sort of simple, uh, first level, that has iconography that suggests otherwise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In which you, religious iconography is supposed to point beyond itself mm -hmm. it, to God, mm -hmm. to the transcendent. So why don't we have religious iconography that can do that through the black body, mm -hmm. right? Yes. right? And it might help to take blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus is down. Uh, uh, as I've said for a long time, that black Jesuses are not simply significant in black churches, they're more significant when they're placed in white churches. Mm -hmm. So that people can begin to see that the black body is something other than d demonic. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and you know, then I think our churches, and I'll shut up with this, <laughs> have to be intentional, uh, to, with intention, beginning to read and be uh, 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 the Bible and open up the way in which we begin to imagine how God moves in our world and, and read the Bible through the lens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Through the lens. If we want to talk about God's justice, well, you can't talk about that unless you talk about it through the lens of those people who have experienced the raw underside of justice itself, right? In this society, that's, that, that's poor black people. That's black people. Uh, to, uh, and you, one can say, oh, no, now, now we bringing that woke stuff to the Bible. No, because the funny thing is, that's the only way you're going to understand the movement of God that is portrayed in the Bible, because, it, you know, Jesus was crucified. Let's act, we have a crucifixion at the center of our faith tradition. Let's act like we do. And that crucifixion is an indication of Jesus' utter solidarity with those people, the crucified classes. So we, we can begin this anti-anti-black narrative. Mm by being intentional in the way in which we forefront and bring to the center of our engagement with the Bible and our understanding of God in the stories that we share and the stories that we read, the black story. Because mm. if you do that, you bring to the forefront God's story. That's a good story. That's a good, good story. <laughs> so one, one, one last question before we open up. Um, your work has been compared in conversations that I've had with, with folk um, to Ta-Nehisi Coates mm. um, because Between the World and Me is a letter for those of you who may not know is a letter between uh, he and his son um, The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin which is essentially a letter to uh, his nephew 
Um, but when I read your book, the first thought that crossed my mind was a poem that came out 100 years ago. Mother to son. Well, I knew you were going <laughs> to. Mother to son. Mother to son. Yeah. Langston Hughes. Life ain't been no crystal Life ain't been stare. no crystal stair. Yeah. And I just wondered yeah. if you could just talk a little oh, bit about, you, oh. you know, you, your, you know, how your relationship with your, your son, your family, but you also talk in your book about Mama Dorsey. Yes. You could just talk a little bit about that and the power, the influence, the significance of the elders, the ancestors, the intergenerational transmission of faith, those kinds of things. Oh, Reverend Dr. Alton, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and this All right. is, but this is, yeah, and you can talk about that as well, because this is the work that you have brought to the center. Uh, for all of us, those intergenerational dialogues, and 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 you quote those things because you live those things, you know those things, and you've made those things clear and brought them to the center of theological and religious discourse. And so I feel like I'm talking to one that can <laughs> talk about it better than me. And because we raise black children, that's right. Because we raise black children, right, right. Yeah. And to raise a black child is one to prepare that black child for the life they have to navigate living while black and helping them to stay alive. Yeah. And not simply stay alive physically, right? But to stay alive mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, mm. right? Mm. And that's what James Baldwin's uh, letter to his nephews all mm. about. When Baldwin mm. says to his nephew, don't believe what your fellow countrymen say about you. Mm. Don't take it in, mm. right? You know, Nikki Young, and the students here reminded me of this, Nikki Young Nikki. talks about, right, the uh, you can be dead, the, how, how, how this society uh, creates for black living dead, kills black people even mm. while they're living. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So you got to have, that's those conversations that you have to have with your children. And they are not, not simply intergenerational because it's between the parent and we as black parents and our children, but we got to bring the other generations along. along. We got to bring them along so that, that, that our children know, right, that they are somebody else's freedom dream. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that to me, and it affirms for them the, the rightness of who they are and, 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 and the fact, you know, it's, I would bring them forward when, you know, saying to, to my son, but, you know, somebody else fought for you to be here. Yes, yes. You're somebody else's freedom dream. And that's what I think of, of, of my grandmama Dorsey, who, uh, as I talk about in various places and so in this book came through from Georgia during the period of the migrations right and ended up didn't have but about a sixth grade education and ended up working in an elevator in Columbus Ohio and uh, her, dream, her dream her dream was that her four grandchildren mm. could simply be able to finish high school mm. she couldn't have a bigger dream than that because the world in which she's living didn't even allow her to go to high school mm. Right. Mm. And so that, you know, that that those are when we talk about that intergenerational yes. dialogue. Right. Yes. These people live with us. Yes. Right. Yes. And I think as I in, in my book and maybe I'll uh, say it in the, again and uh, that, you know, Alton, I always think and, you know, I've talked about this in other ways before. That and I carry this with me and I stop because it's still always arresting to me, that our forebears, our enslaved forebears, right? Born into slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Died in slavery, mm -hmm. never breathed a free breath, right. and never even dreamt that they would breathe a free breath. Yes. But they fought for freedom anyhow. Mm -hmm. They fought for freedom they knew that they would never experience, mm. but they knew that it would one day be. One, that's faith, that's hope, because they believed in the freedom that was the justice of God. Mm. 
and they fought for freedom for us. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Alton, for, for us. us, we wouldn't be here sitting talking today, you and me. You're president of Louisville in Kentucky? Mm. Really? Our people were fleeing Kentucky. That's the truth. And yeah. you sit here president? Mm. Oh. Mm. <laughs> what would they, they their bones are yes. talking about make the dry bones live. Yes. Yes. Tyler, those bones of Ezekiel are jumping all up around in Greg. Yeah. Those those are the stories mm. that I tell my son. And and you know, those are the conversations that we have and some, sometimes when I have no answer, which is most of the time, mm. I just remind him, you know, you come from a line of people that dreamt of this future, mm. who fought for this future, but knew they would never see it, yes. right? Yes. So I tell my yes. son about somebody <laughs> else, we are somebody else's freedom dream. Yes. Mm. We do have a little bit of time, and we'd love to invite uh, a few questions. If anyone would like to ask anything, please. Well, you know, as a mother and as a woman aware of all the young people today who've lost faith in everything, and wondering how we can give them faith and hope and resurrection, when you were talking about your texting with your son, at this moment, where is he in hope and resurrection? What ideas were clinching to get him to where he is at this moment? Well, I'm not sure. I, I think I, I don't know if I say in the book or not, and my son is, uh, just came in today, so he's here. But, uh, you know, I think he's still on the, the right, and you can talk about it, yes. your own kids, on the, uh, he's more of like, he's edging toward Afro-pessimism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, and, he, and, he, and he says to me, we, he's still one of the things that he loves to do is he sends me an article of something, text and says, thoughts, and, and I know here we go. Uh, and one of, one, of, one of the questions he uh, consistently asks me, and you know, you see something like what happened to Tyree Nichols, and which is a part of the way in which anti-blackness is so insidious and infiltrated uh, in the systems and structures, ideology, et cetera, of this country. I, he said, is it time to pack our bags yet? Hmm. Mm -hmm. My son is consistently, and I tell you, if the uh, architect and I, you know, I, well, it, if the architect of the MAGA vision, if the MAGA vision mm. uh, got elected again, mm. uh, I are already told my son, you need to pack your bags. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, because I'm not worried about me. I mean, you know, Alton and I, we were talking about, we're, we're running our last lap. But, uh, 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 and, I, and I was just aspirational by saying I'm running. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> running the last lap, you know. <laughs> uh, um, but our children, yes, and their children, we want them to have a future. That's right. And uh, and so you know, I knew that if that happened, mm -hmm. it was time to at least. I remember my son said, "So where are we gonna go?" I said, "Canada is okay." Mm. Uh, so, but it might be time. So I can't tell you where he is uh, in terms of uh, mm. uh, sort of faith. I know that he's still questioning. And, uh, uh, and sometimes I think, you know, on that border of being sort of an Afro-pessimist, and that's this, this thought that uh, anti-blackness and white racism are so ingrained in our world, really, in the world culture and the, the fabric of it, that you, can, you aren't going to eradicate that. So you have to f figure out a way to navigate it and, and to stay alive and, and hope and faith and all that. Just, OK, just, you just need to figure out how to navigate it and to stay alive. And I'm not sure. I uh, always say to Desmond, oh, I think you kind of uh, Afro-pessimist in that way. Uh, uh, but he hasn't given, you know, he's, he's, 
I, but that's where, what do you do when you have a genera this generation, our children, right? They have, you know, they came to age and an awareness like with Trayvon. Mm, that's right. And Tamir, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And now here we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's this hard and, and they're coming to age when, you know, we had these things happen as we were growing up, but it wasn't, you weren't immediately confronted with it consistently on, uh, through the internet and cyber world. It wasn't going viral. You know, your phone wasn't dinging uh, every minute, like, and their phone dings, and it's like another black person dead. Uh, uh, and it's the ding, you know. You didn't get, you know, the ding. The, our parents didn't get a ding of Emmett Till and everybody else. Imagine. If, if there was uh, cell phones back then during the height of lynching, because that's where we're at right now. These are 21st century lynchings. Mm -hmm. So imagine what happens to a generation and how they'll feel if every day their phone is dinging, you know, breaking news, uh, and they're reporting someone lynched. What that does uh, to one psyche. And I'm always aware that that's what our children are growing up in. I look so forward to reading your book. I haven't read it. Um, I am so <laughs> angry, frustrated, huh. sad at our Christian mm. brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Help me. <laughs> but, um, well, I think what you're, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't no, 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 no. That's uh, it. I think what you're referring to probably, and, and this is, jump in, uh, my friend. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, uh, I think what you're probably referring to in that anger and, and, and that rage is, is, is Christian nationalism. And, uh, you know, white Christian nationalism. And the way in which Christianity, the sort of this far right Christianity has shown up on the public square and the way in which it's controlling the narrative of what it means to be Christian, mm -hmm. right? Now, you know, they're doing <laughs> what they're supposed to be doing. They aren't representing Christianity, but they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're out on the public square, they're talking about what they believe to be whatever, their faith. Those who call ourselves progressive and say, oh no, that's not what Christianity is, we aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing. That's they can only thrive in as much as we allow that, mm -hmm. right? We mm -hmm. have to put out a different narrative. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so maybe you are talking, maybe you are angry at the right Christians, mm -hmm. at, at those of us who claim to be church and who are, are like, oh my goodness, well, how this isn't Christian and they're, they're destroying what it means to be Christian. Well, they can only do that if they're filling a vacuum of what it means to be Christian. Yeah. That's right. And we've created, we've allowed for a vacuum. And so that's why I say it's an aspiration to be church. We need to get out there and be church. And that means that we have to be, where are our voices? We have to be in the forefront. All of this mess about uh, t critiquing woke culture is just a way of, of mystifying what white supremacy is, mm -hmm. right? Where are our voices on, in, on the local levels that we are actually allowing people to say and take over our school board and our school systems? and say you cannot mention race. I mean, they've, they've tried to put out a curriculum, it was in the news, where they were talking about Rosa Parks, Rosa Parks and they didn't even mention race. Now, how do you do that? Yes. Yeah. Where, this is where the church has to show up if it's gonna be church. Mm -hmm. It has to show up and say, no, because we are accountable not to the way things are. We are accountable to this more just future that we claim to believe in. If we are accountable to, to that, then we have to do everything we can in protesting those conditions that block us from living into that more just future. And we cannot settle for the injustice that parades as justice. We are not accountable, we are not to be, I'll say this again, then I'll say it over and over, probably say it on Thursday, we are not to be gatekeepers of the status quo. We have to be a gateway to a more just future, and our churches are not doing that. And you don't have to, I don't, you don't have to get out on Black Lives Matter and protest, but just show up and let your voice be heard, right? And so, yeah, I'm mad at, I'm, I'm, you know, 
I'm not mad at those little white Christian nationalists. Um, uh, they outrage me in a different way. But I really am angry at the sort of progressive white church, right? That isn't doing nothing. And this being mad, well, okay. Your mad is my life. So if we want the next generation to be any better than our generation at enacting racial justice in particular, then we have to share a different narrative, give them a different narrative, a different story, not the same old story. So if nothing else, we got to make our voices heard on the, in the local school level. Because we, we're, we're creating, I'll talk about the, these living monuments to white supremacy. Uh, duh. So yeah, so I, I join you, so that means that, that's why I say churches need to start acting like churches. I don't expect everybody out there carrying a sign or doing whatever they're doing, but I expect them to show up. And I also expect them to show up within their own communities and, 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 and churches and start talking about this stuff. If it's not going to be talked about in the school, then you bring it into your church. One last thing, and you know this, Alton, that's when the black church has always been at its best, at its best. right? Because the black church has always filled in the gap, mm -hmm. the gaps that society has created, the gaps that will not allow for black life to thrive. Mm -hmm. And the black church has always filled those in, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why the black church is, as W.E.B. Du Bois said, the spiritual and the, re the social, rather, and the uh, religious center of the black community. So there's a lesson to be learned from the black church uh, uh, for the wider church on how to be church. And let me just add a PSA, if I might. Yeah. Um, Grave, Virginia. Wonderful spirit bringing question about mother and son. But also want to note, Alice, if you haven't seen the Allison and Wade Houston story yet. Oh. Uh, yes. Um, oh, OK. Got yes. to see it. We've got Thank you. pioneers speaking yep. out of our midst. Thank you. We are you. all in this struggle together. As I mentioned earlier, the 2021 Festival of Faiths, it was called Sacred Change, Essential Conversations on Faith and Race. Everyone is uncomfortable and difficult, and we're so grateful that we could do this in this space oh, together. Um, and just as a, a gift from the festival that we started and this ongoing conversation, um, we have a little gift for you. Oh, thank you. These I are love our this street bag. pole banners that we have out in front of our oh, venue wow. when we host our festival. And it's been repurposed into a bag for you. Oh, I love thanks, that. Thanks uh, to remember us here in Louisville. Thank you. And to keep the conversation going. Thank you for this. And I love this bag. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, my friend. Uh, it's so good to have you here. Oh, it's so good to be here.